setback. The partial setback for the MAGA Republicans follows a similar election result in Brazil. Their Brazilian, uh, their, uh, the Brazilian uh, Trump style president, Jair Bolsonaro, was also narrowly defeated. <clears throat> but just as in Brazil, this far right tendency is nowhere near disappearing. These election results also have global implications, especially for Ukraine, since the MAGA Republicans support Putin. For example, we saw attendees at the fascist and Republican-linked America First Conference last February who were chanting Putin, Putin, Putin. And these fascists have direct representatives in the US Congress, as shown by the fact that among the speakers at the America First Conference, was Congresswoman Marjorie Taylor Greene of Georgia. The question is whether these election results in both the US and Brazil represent a reversal of the global trend towards bigotry and reaction, or whether it is merely a temporary setback for that. In order to answer that question, I think it's necessary to start with considering a little bit of the background. A consideration of that background can only be very general and for uh, time reasons. But I wanna be clear, I'm not defending this turn to reaction. I'm just trying to explain it in the best way that I can. In the first place, we have the crisis of US and world capitalism. That crisis was part and parcel of the so-called globalization of the world economy. And that globalization among other things, thrust the workers of the world into ever deeper and more uh, direct competition for who could make the most profits for the capitalists. That's the so-called race to the bottom. It resulted in lower pay everywhere and the transfer of a lot of production to low wage areas. At the same time, it meant the weakening of the ability of the government to, government to regulate the economy in any way. Also, US society was changing. Whole new groups of people, mainly people of color were entering the country and also gender roles were being redefined. Another fundamental aspect of this process is the irreversible decline in US world domination. And this entire process took place under democratic and Republican administrations alike. The Democrats could not try to take to capture the reactionary drive to return to the past, make America great again, because of their links to the civil rights movement, the feminist movement and so on. The Republicans, given the traditions that even Nixon, that started under Nixon of, uh, of the Southern strategy, the Republicans could. And all of this in a world that was increasingly insecure due to job loss. In a different situation, these changes could have been seen as liberating, but for tens of millions of workers, it was the opposite. That was so also because of another factor the determined campaign to drive out from historical memory all the traditions of the 1930s, the militant class struggle, as well as the radical anti-capitalist traditions. <clears throat> it is understandable and to be expected that the capitalist media, the education system, and the capitalist politicians, Republican and Democrat alike, would do this. But what was most devastating was and is the fact that the entire union bureaucracy the so-called progressive, as well as the conservative wings, participated in this effort. In other words, the general loss of a sense of working class solidarity. The result was that tens of millions of US workers were driven to try to recapture the so-called American dream. So that is what Make America Great Again, MAGA, that is the role that it plays. Return to the American dream at home and abroad. And of course, as the American comedian George Carlin put it, it's called the American dream because you have to be asleep to believe it. But the fact <clears throat> that it never really existed, especially not for black people in the US, made MAGA all the more reactionary and all the more out of touch with reality. Now, some socialists claim that US workers don't support Republicans and MAGA. That is simply wishful thinking. The best single uh, estimate of class as done by the pollsters is education level, not income level. And all the polls show absolutely decisively that Trump supporters are overwhelmingly non-college graduates. 
That's the reverse for Biden supporters. My own personal experience among construction workers tends to confirm this also. That doesn't, oh, by the way, when I said uh, non-college graduates, what I'm talking about actually is white non-college graduates. That doesn't mean that white workers are hopelessly reactionary, not at all. But reality is reality, and we cannot engage in wishful thinking if we want to accomplish anything. Now, under more or less stable conditions, the capitalist class has a deep base of support in all sectors of society, including the working class. That was certainly true for the US capitalist class, and that's partly why capitalist democracy, or what they nowadays call the rule of law, is the best and safest means for the capitalist class to rule in the US. There are also some other reasons. In most cases, the capitalist class was able to sway huge sectors of society to back any policies they favored. But due to the developments I just mentioned, their influence among huge sectors of society declined enormously, a vacuum opened up. And because of the role of the union bureaucracy and also the NGOs in general, that vacuum was not filled by any sort of independent movement of any sector of the working class. That is what explains the rise of Trump. He was neither under control of any sector of the capitalist class, nor did they in general support him initially. For example, during the 2016 Republican primaries, the Wall Street Journal carried editorials and, and uh, columns attacking Trump almost every single day after he won the nomination, and especially when he pushed through his so-called tax reform, they stopped attacking him, but he was never under their control. You can see it uh, in, right. in the, the lack of control of Trump in his consistent attacks on NATO and his orientation towards Putin. You could also see it in his drive to take one person control over the government. And that drive was largely blocked by guess who? the tops of the US military. As Mike Mullen, former head of the Joint Chiefs of Staff made clear, the military commanders would obey every quote, legal order of the president. The underlying message was that they would disobey or an order that they considered to be illegal. That was why Trump was unable to declare martial law and see the ballot boxes in 2020, because the most clear representatives of the capitalist class the military tops would not allow it. And it's a sorry day when we have to depend on the US military to defend democracy. An example of why that was so was the fact that according to the New York Times, in January of 2021, the leadership of the unions got together with the NGO leaders and decided that they were gonna do everything within their power to prevent any sort of mass mobilization to drive Trump out of office at the end of, end of his term. Trump and his supporters tried to overturn the elections through the courts, but in the end, even the Trump Supreme Court ruled against him. I believe that was due to several main factors. First was the fact that he would have needed to overturn the election in at least three states, which was a stretch too far for the Trump Supreme Court. Also, they were not well enough organized. And finally, they couldn't find a legal constitutional cover for it. In other words, the capitalist class had too many levers to pull still. But what they had done was take over the Republican party, lock, stock and barrel. Trump, who one could say is the greatest snake oil salesman that ever lived, had built a base of fanatics, an actual personality cult that took over the Republican party. The most clear indication of their threat to democratic small d norms is their denial of the reality of who won the 2020 elections. That denial is in reality a refusal to accept any outcome other than the one they desire, which is the complete and unchecked domination over US society by their cult. And uh, their campaign against abortion rights is, a, is another example of, of this. It is the poster child for gaslighting. They still, that they still control the party is shown by the election deniers in these elections. According to the Washington Post, of the 569 Republican nominees for office, 291 were election deniers. The Post writes, 
Unofficial projections Tuesday show that the election deniers will amount to a sizable majority within, within the Republican caucus. I, I think you can see that that is, that is a screenshot from CNN and it shows some of the election deniers. <clears throat> These deniers are a minority in the US at, at the base level, at the rank and file level. But given the regional differences, plus gerrymandering, plus voter suppression, they play an outsized role. And don't forget that they, that they do have a, ba uh, have a base as their denialism is coupled with science denialism, plus bigotry and racism. An example is Doug Mastriano, the Republican nominee for Pennsylvania governor. Mastriano is close to being an outright fascist if he is not actually one. Now the media reports that he was overwhelmingly defeated, but the fact is that he got nearly 42% of the vote. Nearly two and a quarter million Pennsylvanians voted for him. Not all of them su uh, supported Mastriano's fascism, but they were willing to accept it or overlook it. The drive among the Republicans is apparently getting the Democratic Party base more active. I got a report from somebody in rural Pennsylvania, the heart of Trump country. She reports that the activism among Democratic voters increased, has increased a lot, both in terms of their meeting size and they're putting out yard signs for Democrats and so on. <clears throat> An amusing report uh, a, guy, um, a guy I know from uh, Philadelphia, PA, is that one friend of his decided to vote for the Democratic Party candidate, John Fetterman, because the Republican, Oz, is from New Jersey and he hates New Jersey. My friend also told me that another person, a relative of his, has switched, had switched to voting for Fetterman because Oprah Winfrey endorsed him. Regarding the question of racism, Back when Bush ran for president, he leaned heavily on the alleged threat of, quote, violent criminals, which was a dog whistle for, for racism. The same is true today, but there is more to the story than that. Here's a, here's a mailer sent around by a group uh, that was backed by the uh, coal train and corporate lobby here in Oakland. You see the ones that they recommend. <clears throat> De La Fuente is the foremost big business representative, but all three are in that group. I'm proud to say that, uh, as you can see, I was the last one of the uh, showed uh, of the other photos. Along with many others, a major issue of their campaign was violent crime in Oakland. And this is not simply a dog whistle for racism. Oakland is 56% black or Latino. And I could see in the, in the uh, forums that I spoke at, that the issue of crime and violence hits very close to home for many people. People complain constantly about the catalytic converters, which are worth up to $2,500, being cut out from under their cars. And in a recent case, somebody who, confer, who, uh, who confronted a thief over this was shot dead in broad daylight. <clears throat> of course, the issue is related, as I pointed out in my campaign, to the issues of poverty, uh, 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 to the issues of poverty for one thing. And I called for a $28 an hour minimum wage. And also to the breakdown of society in general. I called for a renewed working class grassroots movement for, uh, for, uh, that, uh, for, uh, for that increased minimum wage, as well as other demands and for a working class party. Under such, uh, uh, under such a movement, the only under such a movement, will that alienation fade as a sense of solidarity comes to the forefront. Now, you can, where is it? Oh yeah. I'm looking for the, okay. Yeah, so now if you look here, Okay, so now you can see the election results here. <clears throat> Under the ranked choice voting, the tabulation, tabulating of these results 
is very complicated. <clears throat> um, but so far, Taylor and De La Fuente, who were two of the right-wing law and order type candidates, got 47% of the vote, while the liberal union-backed candidate, Sheng Tao, got 29%. Or together with the other main uh, liberal, the Unweva, the result was 36%. <clears throat> so more recent tab tabulations indicate that Taylor will win. This is the candidate who said of the anti-Semitic fascist Peter Liu that he has some, quote, interesting ideas. Incidentally, I, I, uh, I spoke with a Jewish group in the Bay Area that lobbies against anti As I said, I spoke with a Jewish group in the Bay Area that lobbies against anti-Semitism, and they had no interest in picking a fight with the person who seems to be set to be the next mayor here. A related issue is that of homelessness. Those three right-wing candidates, De La Fuente most of all, basically called for kicking the homeless out of Oakland and who cares where they go or what happens to them. It indicated the same heartless, cruel attitude that the Republican party advocates. Then you see the results. My point is that this is not purely racism that is driving the law and order move, although in many cases it is, but it's also the ongoing weakness, the crisis of US capitalism. Now, as far as the end results it's of the general election, it seems the Republicans will probably, but not certainly, capture a slim majority in the lower house, the House of Representatives. The reason that they do better there is that it's easier to gerrymander and manipulate the voting districts. The Democrats retain their slim majority in the Senate. But again, the results in, in the Georgia Senate race were, were as, as astounding. The Republican, Herschel Walker, campaigned in large part for prohibiting all abortions. But it was revealed that he'd pressured at least two former girlfriends whom he'd made pregnant to get an abortion, and he paid for those abortions. Yet he basically tied his opponent, Raphael Warnock. There will be a runoff for that post, and Warnock has already said he's going to campaign on the basis of character that Walker lacks the character to be a senator. That is not exactly calculated to inspire people, especially given that Warnock revealed that Walker revealed that Warnock had used his position as a senator to enrich himself, which of course all the senators do. But overall, the Wall Street Journal, who expresses the views of the more militant sector of the, capital, sector of the capitalist class, summarized the uh, situation when they wrote, two days after the election, quote, Republicans are dismayed and they should be at themselves. Some 70% of voters Tuesday said they're unhappy with the state of the nation. With an unpopular president, 8% inflation, falling real incomes, rising crime and chaos at the border, the GOP should have coasted to at least a normal midterm victory. And the result, there will be bloodletting in the House Republicans as the hidden denialists who are grouped around DeSantis and the Republican House leader, Kevin McCarthy, will try to push the politics of the more crazed Republicans, such as Taylor Greene and the House free, quote, Freedom Caucus into the background. Given that their more blatantly crazed views have been proved to lose elections in many cases, I think the Freedom Caucus may tend to fragment, but others feel emboldened. Already the open denialists, are moving to remove Republican House Leader McCarthy and Republican Senate Leader McConnell. However, the predictions of a return to at least an appearance of sanity are overstated. That's because the Trump cultists at the bottom have largely taken over the party and they won't allow any, any real change. As we all see, there's a bitter struggle between uh, Trump and Florida Governor Ron DeSantis developing as DeSantis prepares uh, prepares to uh, run for the 2024 Republican nomination. And let's be clear, the only difference between the two is that DeSantis is not so narcissistic and therefore a lot more competent. But there's no difference between their uh, politics. Incidentally, every major newspaper in Florida backed, the, uh, backed DeSantis's opponent. But DeSantis has emerged as a winner anyway. And if you look, 
you can see that is how that is how the uh, uh, the the Trump the Trump supporting uh, uh, New York Post how they are now picturing the result of the outcome uh, of the of the election. <clears throat> John, I just want to give you a, 10, 10, a 20 minute time check. So you've got about okay. 10 to 15 right, minutes thanks. left. Please make me co-chair, by the way. Please give me co-chair power. The position of the Democrats as exemplified by Biden is that the problem with the Republicans can be defined in one word, Trump. <clears throat> but that's why all the pundits, by the way, are, are turning towards DeSantis. As the Wall Street Journal again pointed out, in what must have been a first on CNN, a panel of seven, seven commentators had nothing but positive things to say about DeSantis. Now, regarding Ukraine, the Republicans will push for cutting off aid to Ukraine, and Biden has been hesitant enough already. And one wing of his administration, centered around the chief of staff, um, uh, Mark Milley, is pushing for that, while another wing, centered around his uh, uh, Secretary of State, Antony Blinken, is opposing that. <clears throat> but if they are not already headed in that direction, I think a wing of the Trump base will increasingly move towards terrorist violence, especially if Trump loses in 2024 or whatever Republican. We tried elections and it didn't work, will be their thinking. The final question is, where do we, uh, what, uh, where do socialists and others who take the working class position go? What do we advocate? And I think the most pressing issue, the most important task before the working class is to stop the drive to overturn our democratic rights, meaning capitalist democracy. US democracy with all its historic and present day crimes is a lot better than one person dictatorship. How do we oppose the overturning of democratic rights while still fighting for working class independence. I will get into my view in a minute, but I wanna comment on voting for the Democrats. <clears throat> there, there, in the past and at the present, there are, there are two basic considerations. First is whether things would be better under one of the parties than the other. The second is the danger of getting sucked it up into, Democra into Democratic Party which is to say capitalist politics. In the past, the differences were so minimal and the second danger was so great that I think it was right to oppose voting for any Democrat. Today, the second danger, getting sucked up into the Democratic Party politics still exists, but anybody who says that the differences are minimal today really is not paying attention. So if we agree that it's crucial to stop the Republicans, then at the end of the day, we have to spend one or two minutes voting accordingly. And the only alternative to the Republicans right now is the Democrats. The Democrats have proven that over the longer term, they cannot stop the Republicans. So the only way to stop them is to build an independent working class movement, a movement from below that's headed towards building uh, um, an independent working class party based on social principles. <clears throat> and ultimately, I think such a party, while it wouldn't even necessarily start out as, a, as, um, as an electoral party, that it will have to take a position on uh, running for elections. And it will either uh, support uh, Democratic candidates, which will mean that it will no longer be an, an independent working class party, or it will run its own candidates. Ignoring the elections, I don't think is an option. Some argue that if we plan to vote for a Democrat, that we can't also argue for a working class party and for socialism. I believe that my campaign as the independent, as the working class socialist candidate for Oakland mayor proved that that is not the case. So in conclusion, if you watch CNN, or listen to the Democrats, you can see that they would like to return to the old collaboration between the Republicans and the Democrats. And they think that Donald Trump is the cause uh, of the end of that collaboration. An article in Foreign Affairs, the foremost journal of the strategists for US capitalism, 
explained uh, explains the reality that uh, in this comment on the 2020 election, quote, the contentious, contentious election season should leave no one sanguine for the future. The autocratic populist turn of Trump presidency arose from deep fractures in the US politics and society. The roots of Trumpism don't begin or end with Trump or even with American politics. They are closely connected to economic and political currents affecting much of the world. The exact same thing can be said now too, also two years later. The alternative is certainly not what they call quote bipartisan politics, which is to say Republican democratic collaboration, nor is it the Democrats in general. The alternative is the mobilization, the independent mobilization of the working class in the streets, in working class communities and schools, and equally important in the unions themselves, headed towards building a working class party and, uh, and, and, uh, and, and also for socialism. This, with this video, which is, this is um, a video of my election of part of my presentation at one of the uh, forums. And it's, I've added some, uh, some vi visual to it also. I hope this works. Let's see. So you want to talk about the youth and the youth are our future and all of that? Well, their future is being destroyed, let's be blunt about it, by capitalism. And we know if you study history, that the only way that we're gonna get any changes in this country or any place in the world for that matter, is when working class and poor people organize and fight and demand those changes and make sure that the country, that the system does not run until we get the changes we want. I just wanna explain, these are extracts from parts of, uh, you know, different extracts from my presentations at this forum. So they talk about the golden rule. That is, he who has the gold makes the rules. And we have to answer with something else. Might makes right. And so the only rights that we have are the ones that we are well enough organized to fight for and, and to demand and to bring into existence. We've got a double freight train roaring down the track towards us. The first is the racist, fascist, connected Republican Party, which has already taken over the Supreme Court, which very likely will take over Congress, and in two years from now, by hook or by crook, may take over the presidency. And every reform that we want to talk about and think about here in Oakland will be washed away like a sandcastle in front of the un 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 uh, incoming tide if we don't have a movement to stop that. That's number one. The other is the whole question of global warming. This is an example of why we need a working class party to oppose these two parties of big business. And we need a working class movement to reverse the direction of this whole country and why not, and why shouldn't it start here in Oakland? Oakland was, the, incidentally, was the last general strike was here in Oakland, 1946. Oakland led the way with the Black Panther Party. Oakland led the way with Occupy Oakland. And we have to start again for Oakland to lead the way to reverse the whole direction of politics in this country and in the world. I'm not to vote for me and I'll send you free candidate. I'm the working class socialist candidate for mayor of Oakland. And if my campaign does nothing but to get a few people resolved to organize and fight for the changes we need, then that's enough. So I wanted to I wanted to post that <clears throat> we are being deceived. The border crisis Hold is on. not Sorry like what we've been told. Behind the five million illegal. Sorry about that. So <clears throat> I wanted to post that as an example of how I think that we can relate to people who are not politically active or who are just thinking about getting politically active, uh, but working class people and young people. And I have to say that 
um, people are not going to get active just around the issues that we think are important. And uh, they're not going to do it in an organized, clear way. For those who haven't, who aren't familiar with it, you know, like I always think about like the Occupy movement or the Yellow Vest movement in France, where millions of people just poured out into the streets, blocked and shut down the cities all across the country in, uh, in opposition to a new tax on, uh, on working class people. And they had no clear program, they had no clear strategy. They just knew that they were pissed off and they wanted to do something about it. And it was enormously confusing mo uh, movement. But I think that if there is a movement that's gonna develop here in this country, it's going to be along similar lines. And the thing for us is to speak to that new movement or the new movement that isn't even here yet. And to try to think, of, think about how young people and workers, what, what they're thinking now and how we can relate to that. Um, so, and also we have to, we have to understand that, you know, a lot, of, we have to work out a lot of issues amongst ourselves. I'm talking about the old time socialists, myself included, but also not all those, not all those issues are going to relate to young people who are going to be the central element in, in the movement. Um, so with that in mind, um, I want to make one comment about collaborating with the Democrats. And in my mind, there's a fundamental difference between taking two or three minutes at voting time and coloring some, in some, some, some spaces on a sheet of paper or, or, and putting it in the mail or putting a scrap of paper in a ballot box. There's a fundamental difference between that and running on the Democratic Party line, and being, which inevitably has to mean getting involved in trying to change the Democrats, trying to make the Democratic Party, uh, trying to move it to the left and so on. And you, it's been proven just by what we've seen over the last 10 years, if not before, that the minute that you get involved in that, you look, look at, for instance, compare DSA, to the Democratic Party. The Democratic Party is literally millions of times more powerful. And so it, 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 it's like an object in space that's in between the sun and the earth. Which gravitational force is gonna be more powerful? It's gonna be the sun, whether you like it or not. And we've just seen it time and time and time again, that in every single case, they get sucked into the Democratic Party. And that has a practical consequence. And the practical consequence is that they cannot, and they do not, and they never have actually tried to build an independent movement of working class people, such as what I was describing, like could have been with the Yellow Vest movement and so on. Why? Because that's not, the, the entire history of the Democratic Party is up in is opposed to that. So I do think that any new movement that develops, if there's millions of young people and workers that pour out into the streets at, at some time, at some point, that we do have to do everything in our power to make sure that it doesn't get drawn into the arena of a Democratic Party through this or that or the other quote progressive Democrat. On the Green Party, I mean, I had thought after the uh, 2016, no, 2020 election, no, tw I'm sorry, 2016 election, when Trump came in, that there would be a whole layer of young people that moved to the Green Party. That didn't happen. And in my experience, number one, the Green Party has, uh, I mean, I welcome Howie Hawkins here and, and uh, other comrades from the Green Party, but I have not seen any history of the Green Party actually trying to build a movement in the streets. And that is going to be the starting point. We saw that with the Black Lives Matter movement. So, uh, you know, 
that's that's kind of a, a, a main the main point to me. Um, now on I'm just looking for so Mudassir asked about the influence of Saudi Arabia in in US elections. And I don't think it's that great, really. For one thing, you can see that both the two parties are because Saudi Arabia is basically tied in with Israel, as far as I can see, with the only real difference being that Saudi Arabia has a lot of oil. Um, and 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 also has a base, you know, amongst like Islamic fundamentalists and so on. But I don't see them having that that great of an of an influence um and as far as if donald trump runs again in 2024 i mean if he runs or desantis runs doesn't matter they're they're both the same i mean there is and when you come to the ballot when you come time when it comes time to actually voting there is no alternative to voting for the democrats if you want to keep these fascist connected and I don't call them fascists, but fascists connected Republicans out of office. Um, so I think those are those are the main points. But again, I think that we should start that our starting point has to be how will this mo new movement develop, and how do we relate to it, even when it hasn't started yet. John, do you want to answer Simon's question about Ukraine? Oh, then... yes. Yeah, 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 yeah. Sorry. Um, so, I mean, I mentioned how the Republicans, Trump first and foremost, uh, are connected with Putin. And given the, re given the Republicans, you know, their, their link to fascists like, the Ameri like America First, who openly support Putin, you know, I think there's no doubt that, I mean, the Republicans, the, the far right Republicans are already now pushing for cutting off aid to Ukraine. And it's interesting, it's a bit of a role reversal because the Republicans were always the ones who were really pushing US military intervention. But now, since they have uh, political links with Putin, and I think since they realized that if Putin gains an advantage and wins something in this war, that it's going to strengthen the far right all around the world. So now they're pushing to cut off aid, in, in essence, to, to Ukraine. I hope that answers the, the question. Okay. Um, before I call on Linda, um, Tandiwe, don't go. I, I see. Thank you. I, would you would you like to say anything before you leave? Tandiwe? Um, I don't want to say too much, but thank you so much for having me. I just really enjoyed listening to you guys. And it's actually one of my first elections that I was able to vote in. And I noticed like a lot of barriers, especially as a college student. I know our age group and the young people you're talking about, young people. Um, people always say that like we don't show up with voting and I never really understood why until I was like able to vote and see how hard it is to get those absentee ballots and um, to really stay connected into like the grassroots movements that are going on in your hometown. Um, but yeah, I enjoyed listening to talk, listening to you all and I did invite a friend Grandpa, really proud of you and your campaign. My friend voted for you, but I do have to go. It's nice thank, to thank you so much for coming. And I hope that you'll join us again. We look forward to seeing you in California after you graduate. Yes, me too. Okay. okay, I see Asenia. Asenia, would you like to say anything before you go? We really want to hear from young people, especially young women. Oh, I guess she's gone. Okay. All uh, right. Actually, sorry, I'll speak really fast. Okay. okay. Um, again, thank you for having me. This was also my first year voting in this up uh, this election that just happened. 
And like Tandiwe, I felt similarly, but also this discussion was really interesting as a sociologist um, major, like that's my major. So hearing this discussion helped expand on my perspective on a few of these topics. And also I learned something new. So thank you. So I, I, you're welcome to attend our future meetings and we'll probably send you email notices about them <laughs> so you can ignore them or, or, or respond. So thank you. Okay. Um, so be, Linda, are you going to talk about uh, November 19th? Because I want to make sure we talk about that before we end this meeting. No, I was just going to say something, something um, in defense of the essay. <laughs> oh. But I mean, I, okay. all right. Well, all right. Uh, yeah, I want to make sure that we talk about November 19th before people start signing off. So, but go ahead. Well, I've been, I was a member of the Green Party and I'm also a member of DSA. Um, and I have to say that well, what DSA has done is, is, is really way in excess of what the Green Party was able to do. And I think they both started out with kind of the same, you know, assets, so to speak, among the electorate. Um, the Democratic Party would never. Um, uh, tolerate a caucus of DSA in the, in the Congress. I mean, they would not, they would never even recognize that a group like DSA or the Green Party or any, anything like that even exists. Um, I mean, it, they, they've been, um, their main function in life has been to snuff out the left or, or use it to, um, as an excuse for why they, they won't uh, fight, fight the right. You know, they have, some, they have this whole elaborate cosmology about spoilers and uh, how we're to blame for everything and all those hundreds of millions of people that don't vote because they don't have anything to vote for. Well, those people don't count. So they're not the reason why the Democrats always lose. Um, so, I mean, uh, the essay is, you know, it's got problems, but we had people on and most of its national leadership is campused, but we had people on this um, meeting on the 10th from di various dissident DSA chapters or, or, or individuals. Um, you know, there's, there's a, a debate going on there and it's a very important debate and i don't know i mean in minneapolis we endorsed six local candidates uh for local office and including the state senate and, and state state representatives and they all won in fact a couple of them were incumbents and one of them just became the leader of the house democratic caucus or, or whatever it was. i mean you know it, it doesn't it doesn't sound wonderful when i, when I put it that way but <laughs> you know it's really it really it does it does represent a fissure that ne didn't exist, you know, like ten years ago. So anyway, that's that's my um, defense of the DSA. So I'll, I'll shut up now before everybody gets mad at me. Um, I'm going to call on Brad before I call on Luke because Brad just joined us and yeah. So Brad, we you you missed the presentation as well as most of the discussion, but but yeah, go ahead, go ahead. Well, thanks. I'll be brief. Apologies for thinking this was going to be at 9 a.m. my time. Uh, but um, and I can watch the if you're video, if you're recording this, I'll just watch the recording if I need to know what happened. So I'm going to be brief here. It's simply explain that um, <clears throat> much of the I've I've been involved for years now with um, working together, collaborating with Ted Zor, who's not at this meeting and a really deep dive into the nature, the historical and social nature of this thing we call the United States of America, and by extension, English speaking North America, including Canada. And so I, I approach this whole thing from quite a different perspective and framework than it is generally done by people on the left uh, basically. Um, so I'm not going to, it would require a certain amount of time for me to, to explain to people what that perspective is. But basically, you know, the basic mistake that I think a lot of people make is that we have a party system in the United States made up of independently organized political parties, uh, like Europe, for example, which has parliamentary systems generally. But we don't have a parliamentary system here. We have basically a state sponsored, we have two state sponsored parties. They have a monopoly of political power by monopolizing the state office. This was by design of the, 
the framers of the 1787 Constitution, who were hostile to what they called faction, which they equated with political party. And this is a radically different state-sponsored political system from just about every other um, state in the world, whether inside or outside of Europe. Um, and that's basically where I, where I take off in presenting perspective of the present day political situation in the United States. Um, so the, the last thing I'll say here is that I've come to the conclusion that we, the only way forward for any kind of left-wing politics, especially socialist and working class oriented politics in the United States is to uh, advocate for what I call a democratic revolution as a minimum demand to displace and, and re replace the entire political regime. There's no way channel through the political regime, through any of its two parties for a socialist and working class politics to advance. And I think the, last, the history of the last 100 years demonstrates that which would require a whole presentation to prove it. But um, that's my conclusion. And I'm gonna leave it at that. Thanks. Okay, okay. thanks, Brett. Um, so we, people are starting to sign off. So I just wanna point out in the chat, uh, Brian posted the link to register, to participate online um, to this uh, event that is being sponsored by Code Pink and the Answer Coalition. Um, it is, well, I'm, I'm referring to it as the most sort of international in nature event that the um, pro-Putinists, the campus, whatever you want to call them, have organized so far, calling for de negotiations. It's an event, the in-person event will take place in New York at a place called the People's Forum. Um, but, and we, you know, uh, People involved in the campaign are will be there with pickets. They'll participate if they're allowed to, but the rest of us who aren't in New York can participate online. We have a flyer that's almost ready to go for this event. And actually I could put, well, we'll be posting it soon and it'll be available for this. But it's just really important that, that as many people as possible who are in the side of solidarity with Ukraine um, participate in this event. So just wanted to announce that again. There's in, there'll be information about it on the Facebook page. And again, the Brian posted the link to register in the chat. So, okay, we've got uh, Luke, go ahead. Thanks. You know, I realized that my comment really might just kind of open up the discussion more, um, but I'll say it. And if, you know, and the meeting doesn't have to go on. I, you know, I, I suppose, well, one, you know, I, I think the problem with the DSA and a problem that any uh, left group will face, does face any new left party, uh, is it's very anti-democratic nature. So I think um, outside of, you know, perhaps positions that folks take in regards to international issues within the leadership, um, the organization itself is just very much hostile to real debate and, and democracy. So I think that um, is a major blockage. The other thing, you know, that I just think about, and I know it's the age old question that, that we can probably all talk about until the cows come home, so to speak, but just that if there is, and hopefully there will be, you know, some, and I'm sure there will be genuine expressions of, of discontent and outrage that manifest in the streets that without something existing, um, where will that energy and organization go to? Um, and so, um, again, the project I've been involved in in the DSA is about uniting the existing disparate left tendencies within the DSA, um, and ultimately then trying to turn the DSA into some kind of organization or something that comes out of that through unity of the existing left uh, as a new project uh, to create something so that then when that energy does come, um, 
it doesn't kind of go off or, or inevitably, or I shouldn't say inevitably, but get potentially co-opted by the very strong force of the Democratic Party. Thanks. Um, before I call on Pete and then Avram, who have already spoken once, um, I see Brian's note in there. Um, I just want to see if anybody who hasn't spoken yet would like to speak. Anything, M Melody, would you like to speak? I'm putting David, Bill Young, Olivier, um, John Anderson, Frank, anybody? Okay. All right. I just have a procedural question. Oh, okay. No, I just want to know for the 19th, I'm going to try to go at this identifiable banners or something, because I don't mix up with the you oh. know, pink tape. Um, okay, well, I have a suggestion. It, um, it, if people could, people that are interested in November 19th can stay after we finish this official discussion, that'd be great because we can talk in more detail about that. I think that would be great if yeah. people do that because Brian also. I'm not sure I can stay, but I'll see what I can do. But okay. if it's not, I'll just. Okay. Practice. Okay. Thanks. Yeah, very good. Okay, I'm going to call on Frank because he hasn't spoken yet. And then Pete. Hello, everybody. Thanks for inviting me. Uh, actually, Stan Heller is the one who invited me to become part of this group, and uh, I find it very interesting. And it's it's a very complex issue because we have so much to face on the national and international scale, and the 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 resurgence of extreme nationalism is such a major uh, uh, problem in the world. But also the problem within the left, these the split between those who are now, uh, in, you know, uh, basically soft peddling uh, Putin and uh, his regime. And uh, I like what Luke said about gathering all the forces of various left groups that uh, within the DSA, but even in the larger society as a whole, we need to we need to develop methods to become a community and to really engage with all of these different disparate uh, fragmented movements. Uh, and that's a difficult task because it, it really involves creating a kind of ideological unity that doesn't exist. And uh, part of the problem, I think, which we have, I don't know if this has even been raised, is the, uh, the perception within the larger working class of socialism <laughs> and, and the left in general. And that, to me, is a very big problem because uh, the history of of the failures in the Eastern Bloc countries and other countries that have attempted to create some version of socialism has created a base within, even within the working class in the United States. And many of them are immigrants from those countries who have a very, very strong suspicions and strong questions about it. And so I think we have to also figure out a way to address those while building a movement within uh, these different disparate movements that are already out there and, and building a larger community of resistance. That's about all I can come up with right now. I'm, I'm still trying to digest everything everybody else has said, so <laughs> excuse me. Um, okay, uh, Avram, so, um, go ahead. And then, and then I think we're gonna close discussion and talk about November 19th. Oh, no, no, I, um, I was going to see if I didn't have a question. Okay, John, John, um, I, I think you kind of uh, did your follow up. Is there anything else briefly, very, very briefly that you'd like to say? And then I think we should spend the last uh, 10 or 15 minutes talking about November 19th, but we have still a good group here. Unmute, unmute, unmute. Uh, yes, please. First of all, in relation to Ukraine, you know, just as the victory of Putin in Ukraine will boost the far right around the world, you can say the same as far as the victory of Trump or the Republicans, that that will boost the far right around the world and also will would strengthen Putin, Putin's invasion of Ukraine. So the two, I think, are interlinked. Um, but the main thing I think that we should really keep in mind is that we have to think in terms of not what we want to happen, not the kind of movement that we would like to see, but 
what conditions, what kind of movement will history and the current uh, uh, and and the current conditions bring about, force into existence? What kind of movement do we think is both necessary and possible? Um, and I've kind of expressed my view on it, but and I think that also we have to learn to think and talk in terms of relating to that movement and even when it doesn't exist yet um and as far as this issue about what direction will a movement uh, move turn to i don't think it necessarily has to turn to a pre-existing organizations especially when there's no organization that i know of and i have to say it that includes dsa which is actually stands for building that kind of chaotic wild militant fighting movement in the streets and so i think that what we have to do is think in terms of well what kind of organization can such a movement uh, start how can an organization which is to say really a political party start to develop out of and through uh, uh, such a movement and finally i'm not belittling the lessons that we here who are a little bit longer in the tooth that we've learned over the years but again we i think that we have to learn to relate those lessons and and our experiences to the younger generation which will really be the salvation of this planet if there is to be one after a full discussion the speaker john ryman replied to the some comments and some of the questions. I'd like to start with this with this video, which is this is um, a video of my election, a uh, part of my presentation at one of the uh, forums, and it's I've added some uh, some vi visual to it also. I hope this works. The issue is what we stand for, what we fight for and how we advocate getting it. So you want to talk about the youth and the youth are our future and all of that? Well, their future is being destroyed, let's be blunt about it, by capitalism. And we know if you study history, that the only way that we're going to get any changes in this country or any place in the world for that matter is when working class and poor people organize and fight and demand those changes and make sure that the country, that the system does not run until we get the changes we want. So they talk about the golden rule. That is, he who has the gold makes the rules. And we have to answer with something else. Might makes right. And so the only rights that we have are the ones that we are well enough organized to fight for and, and to demand and to bring into existence. We've got a double freight train roaring down the track towards us. The first is the racist, fascist, connected Republican Party, which has already taken over the Supreme Court, which very likely will take over Congress, and in two years from now, by hook or by crook, may take over the presidency. And every reform that we want to talk about and think about here in Oakland will be washed away like a sand castle in front of the uh, un, un, uh, uh, incoming tide if we don't have a movement to stop that. That's number one. The other is the whole question of global warming. It's an example of why we need a working class party to oppose these two parties of big business. And we need a working class movement to reverse the direction of this whole country. And why not? And why shouldn't it start here in Oakland? Oakland was, the, incidentally, was the last general strike was here in Oakland, 1946. Oakland led the way with the Black Panther Party. Oakland led the way with Occupy Oakland. And we have to start again for Oakland to lead the way to reverse the whole direction of politics in this country and in the world. I'm not the vote for me and I'll set you a free candidate. I'm the working class socialist candidate for the mayor of Oakland. And if my campaign does nothing but to get a few people resolved to organize and fight for the changes we need, then that's enough. I wanted to post that 
as an example of how I think that we can relate to people who are not politically active or who are just thinking about getting politically active, uh, but working class people and young people. And I have to say that um, people are not going to get active just around the issues that we think are important. And I, they're not going to do it in an organized, clear way. For those who haven't, who aren't familiar with it, you know, like I always think about like the Occupy movement or the Yellow Vest movement in France, where millions of people just poured out into the streets, blocked and shut down the cities all across the country in, uh, in opposition to a new tax on, uh, on working class people. And they had no clear program. They had no clear strategy. They just knew that they were pissed off and they wanted to do something about it. And it was enormously confusing uh, movement. But I think that if there is a movement that's going to develop here in this country, it's going to be along similar lines. And the thing for us is to speak to that new movement or the new movement that isn't even here yet. And to try to think, of, think about how young people and workers, what, what they're thinking now and how we can relate to that. Um, so, and also we have to, we have to understand that, you know, a lot, we have to work out a lot of issues amongst ourselves. I'm talking about the old time socialists, myself included, but also not all those, not all those issues are going to relate to young people who are going to be the central element in, in the movement. Um, so with that in mind, um, I want to make one comment about collaborating with the Democrats. And in my mind, there's a fundamental difference between taking two or three minutes at voting time and coloring some, in some, some, some spaces on a sheet of paper or, or, and putting it in the mail or putting a scrap of paper in a ballot box. There's a fundamental difference between that and running on the Democratic Party line and being, which inevitably has to mean getting involved in trying to change the Democrats, trying to make the Democratic Party, uh, trying to move it to the left and so on. And you, it's been proven just by what we've seen over the last 10 years, if not before, that the minute that you get involved in that, you look, look at, for instance, compare DSA to the Democratic Party. The Democratic Party is literally millions of times more powerful. And so it, 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 it's like an object in space that's in between the sun and the earth. Which gravitational force is gonna be more powerful? It's gonna be the sun, whether you like it or not. And we've just seen it time and time and time again, that in every single case, they get sucked into the Democratic Party. And that has a practical consequence. And the practical consequence is that they cannot, and they do not, and they never have actually tried to build an independent movement of working class people, such as what I was describing, like could have been with the Yellow Vest movement and so on. Why? Because that's not the, the entire history of the Democratic Party is up in is opposed to that. So I do think that any new movement that develops, if there's millions of young people and workers that pour out into the streets at, at some time, at some point, that we do have to do everything in our power to make sure that it doesn't get drawn into the arena of a Democratic Party through this or that or the other quote progressive Democrat. On the Green Party, I mean, I had thought after the uh, 2016, no, 2020 election, no, tw I'm sorry, 2016 election, when Trump came in, that there would be a whole layer of young people that moved to the Green Party. That didn't happen. And in my experience, number one, the Green Party has, uh, I mean, I welcome Howie Hawkins here and, and 
uh, other comrades from the Green Party, but I have not seen any history of the Green Party actually trying to build a movement in the streets. And that is going to be the starting point. We saw that with the Black Lives Matter movement. So, uh, you know, that's that's kind of a, a, a main, the main point to me. Um, now on, I'm just looking for, so M Mudassir asked about the influence of Saudi Arabia in, in US elections. And I don't think it's that great, really. For one thing, you can see that both the two parties are, because Saudi Arabia is basically tied in with Israel, as far as I can see, with the only real difference being that Saudi Arabia has a lot of oil. Um, and, and, and also has a base, you know, amongst like Islamic fundamentalists and so on. But I don't see them having that, that great of an, of an influence. Um, and as far as if Donald Trump runs again in 2024, I mean, if he runs or DeSantis runs, doesn't matter, they're, they're both the same. I mean, there is, an, when you come to the ballot, when you come time, when it comes time to actually voting, there is no alternative to voting for the Democrats. If you wanna keep these fascist connected, and I don't call them fascist, but fascist connected Republicans out of office. Um, so I think those are, those are the main points. But again, I think that we should start, that our starting point has to be, how will this mo new movement develop? And how do we relate to it, even when it hasn't started yet? John, do you want to answer Simon's question about Ukraine? Oh, then... yes. Yeah, 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 yeah. Sorry. Um, so, I mean, I mentioned how the Republicans, Trump first and foremost, uh, are connected with Putin. And given the, re given the Republicans, you know, their, their link to fascists like, the Ameri like America First, who openly support Putin, you know, I think there's no doubt that, uh, I mean, the Republicans, the, the far right Republicans are already now pushing for cutting off aid to Ukraine. And it's interesting, it's a bit of a role reversal because the Republicans were always the ones who were really pushing US military intervention. But now, since they have uh, political links with Putin, and I think since they realize that if Putin gains an advantage and wins something in this war, that it's gonna strengthen the far right all around the world. So now they're pushing to cut off aid in, in essence to, to Ukraine. You know, just as the victory of Putin in Ukraine will boost the far right around the world, you can say the same as far as the victory of Trump or the Republicans, that that will boost the far right around the world and also will would strengthen Putin, Putin's invasion of Ukraine. So the two, I think, are interlinked. Um, but the main thing I think that we should really keep in mind is that we have to think in terms of not what we want to happen, not the kind of movement that we would like to see, but what conditions, what kind of movement will history and the current uh, uh, to, and, and the current conditions bring about force into existence? What kind of movement do we think is both necessary and possible? Um, and I've kind of expressed my view on it, but and I think that also we have to learn to think and talk in terms of relating to that movement. And even when it doesn't exist yet, um, and as far as this issue about what direction will a movement uh, move, turn to, I don't think it necessarily has to turn to a pre-existing organizations, especially when there's no organization that I know of, and I have to say it, that includes DSA, which is 
actually stands for building that kind of chaotic, wild, militant fighting movement in the streets. And so I think that what we have to do is think in terms of, well, what kind of organization can such a movement uh, start? How can an organization, which is to say, really a political party, start to develop out of and through uh, uh, such a movement? And finally, I'm not belittling the lessons that we hear who are a little bit longer in the tooth that we've learned over the years. But again, we I think that we have to learn to relate those lessons and, and our experiences to the younger generation, which will really be the salvation of this planet if there is to be one.